Okay, let's get this started on the, on the joke here. So, all right, get started. Everybody knows this. Da 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 Batman, if I could listen to you across the pond there. So uh, I, I have to make a confession. I grew up loving the show Batman. Um, the Batman I grew up is a little bit different than the one you, you probably know. Uh, my Batman, he was, uh, you know, he, Batman was the first superhero that really had no superpowers, unless you count being super rich as, as being a superpower. But uh, he, uh, uh, he was, he was civic minded. He always wanted to do what was best for the community. He always did his best. He used his gadgets to, to bring criminals to justice. He had a great sense of humor. He had all these cool gadgets like the Batmobile. I just, I just love watching those episodes. If you get a chance on YouTube or, or, or Netflix or whatever you watch over there, pull up the old Batman shows. They're, they're absolutely hilarious to watch. I, I love them. The Batman, you, you know, probably talks like this and he's got some personal issues. He should probably work out with a therapist, but uh, he's still, a, he's still a cool guy. I still like Batman. I've always, always been a big, big fan of the Batman. He's probably one of my, he is my favorite uh, superhero. So when people say bats, I, this is what I think of. I think of Batman. Unfortunately, not everybody does that. When, when some people, actually, when most people think of bats, I'm going to caution you here. This next slide is a little scary for some people. They think of Dracula. You know, it was uh, in 1897, actually written by a, an Irish author. So over there in Ireland, his name was Bram Stoker. And he, he uh, wrote this uh, novel that just scared everybody. It was a horror novel. And then once we figured out how to make movies, a lot of movies were made with Dracula and still the TV shows. And you can still you can you can turn on your TVs and movies and see all kinds of stuff about Dracula. And it just it quite honestly just really sucks. I, I can't believe it. You know, God gave us such a beautiful animal that does such good things for us. And we and we're fearful of it because of things like this. On the other hand, you have things like mice and rat, rats, you know, they for for centuries uh, have gotten into man's food supplies and they poop and pee and have created all kinds of uh, um, all kinds of diseases and spread plagues and so forth. And yet we all love Mickey Mouse and Chuck E. Cheese and those kinds of things. It's just like the devil. You know, he takes something really, really good and turns it into something we're scared of. And he has something really kind of a bad, bad animal, but yet we all want it and crave it. And kids want to go there for pizza parties and, and to see the Magic Kingdom and so forth. So that is just like what the devil does with everything else in this life. So as we go through this presentation, it is seriously my prayer that when you talk about bats or think about bats or see a bat in the future, you think about good things and you say, hey, thank you, God, for, for sending that bat here. Um, I, I would hope that at least you, uh, uh, you may not love them and which is fine, but at least I hope you're not scared of them anymore. So let's, let's, for, let's learn about bats in a different way than you probably ever learned about them. So we're going to start with some true and falses. You don't have to, you don't have to enter this. Uh, I think I can, I can probably guess what you, mo I've given this enough times. I understand what people guess true and false, but, uh, rabies. So, uh, for those of you not familiar with rabies, it's a, it's a, it's a disease that uh, a lot of wild animals have and we call rabid. Uh, they foam with the mouth and if they bite humans, they can make you really sick. So people tend, at least over here in the United States, people tend to think of bats having rabies. Uh, so most bats have rabies, true or false? Tick, 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 tick. All right, I probably already uh, thought, but the answer is false actually. You know, even though people associate bats with rabies, only one half of 1% of bats have rabies. So if you think, what is that? I have a thousand bats. You might have five of them that have rabies. That's, that's not very many, but because we only see bats when they're really, really sick, that's, that's why people tend to think of that. How about this? If you do have a bat with rabies, just being around a bat can give you rabies. True or false? False. You actually have to be bitten. Um, you know, just, just because you're near one, or even if you actually touch one, uh, sometimes people scratch and if you go to the hospital, they still may give you the protocol just in case there is exchange of body fluids, but you actually have to be bitten by a bat. Um, and uh, so bats need blood to live. That's actually false. False. In Europe, actually, even where, where this guy wrote the, uh, the novel back in 1897, you know, you don't have any vampire bats over there. If you want to find a vampire bat, you have to come over to our side of the pond. You have to go to Mexico, Central and South America. And then again, there's not very many of them. Uh, but even then, even if you do encounter one, unless you're a little amphibian 
or something very, very small, don't worry about it. They're, they're not after, they're not trying to suck your blood. They're not trying to get you. You're, you're way too big for them to eat. How about this? Dogs and cats should not be around bats. So we all think about that. True or false? The answer is false. Not to say it couldn't happen, but there has not been any documented cases ever that a bat has ever infected a dog or a cat with any sort of disease. Okay, here's the last one. Let's change it up a little bit. Question, bats are dirty animals. What do you think about this? I usually get a lot of people get this one on the true side, but the answer is false. Bats are actually very good groomers. Bats do not like to get dirty. You get a bat slimy and they, they want to brush it off or they'll lean up next to their, their buddy and have their buddy help brush it off. Um, you know, animals like mice and, and rabbits and so forth, they pee and poop where they sleep. Bats are not that way. That when they, when they poop, they actually leave the nest and fly away or they make sure it drops out of their nest. So bats are not a dirty animal that, that people tend to think of. So there's some true and false just to kind of blow up some, some myths that, that a lot of people have when they think about that. So this one, I normally say, who wore it cutest? And people go, ah. Oh. So, so what I want you to do is I want you to look at this list, or look at all these pictures, and I want you to tell me which animal you think is the cutest. We have a baby fox. We have a baby squirrel. We have baby kitty cats. We have baby puppy dogs. We have baby skunks, we have baby coyotes, we have baby raccoons, and lastly, we have baby bats. So think about that, enter that in the comment section. Um, but I'm going to tell you that if you enter bats, I'm gonna give you two extra points on your, on your uh, worksheet that you're working on, okay? So if you say that you think the bats are cutest. So to be honest, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, when you look at all these baby animals that God gave us to look at, I would submit to you that the bat is definitely as cute as any other baby animal that God gave us to look at. It's definitely not any uglier. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, they're, all, they're all cute. God made a lot of wonderful creatures. And bats really are, are nice and pretty and, and so forth when you look at them in the right, right way. So, I, again, one thing I really hope to do here today is to is to convey that the bats really shouldn't be scared you shouldn't be scared of them okay so let, let's let's deal a little bit more on this rabies issue because people really do have a have a serious mindset on this and i want to blow up with some actual facts so the united states center for disease control they actually tracked when they would find rabid animals and they would uh through the years so starting in 1966 uh, the latest data i have is in 2014 in this chart and so different animals are represented by different colors. So if you were to look at this chart, which animal would you be the most scared of? Would it be the red animal because it peaks up at close to 5,000 one year? Uh, possibly the purple animal because it, you know, over 4,000. Uh, would it be the blue animal that's, you know, gradually creeping up? Or, or maybe just the green animal down along the bottom? So. Let you think about that. You can think, you don't have to submit that in your answers, but uh, think about it. Which animal would you be most concerned of? And I'm gonna tell you which ones are which. So raccoons are actually the red animal. You know, the raccoons uh, tend to, uh, through the 1990s, tend to have a really problem with, uh, with uh, being really sick. Uh, skunks here in the United States, uh, again, uh, there's been a lot of skunks that, that uh, have, uh, you know, by nature of what skunks eat and so forth, they, they tend to, to get sick when everything else gets sick. Foxes are, you know, pretty, pretty low on the list. But when you look at bats, bats really are, are you know, kind of lower end of that. Um, however, to be honest, when you do ask Alexa, if you have Alexa, you know, which animals have the most rabies, uh, you will see there on the very end, they are creeping up above the, the other animals. But the point is, is that bats get sick just like any other animals that you find in the woods. If you find any kind of animal that appears to be sick, leave it alone. Um, we tend not to see bats because most of the bats fly around at night. There's actually a lot of bats out there. Um, we don't realize how many. Uh, I've been told that if you were to line up all the mammals in the world, line up every single mammal, every single mouse, every single horse, every single cat and dog and so forth, Bats would actually be, on average, one out of every three mammals that we have on this planet. There are so many bats, but we never see them because they fly around at night when 
when we're in bed sleeping and things are dark outside. So when you do see a bat, it's probably in the daylight and it's probably, it's probably not feeling well. So leave it alone if you do find them and it's not acting right. That, that's, that's the message here, okay? So they're no more sick, they're, no, they're no, more, no more less sick, they're no more sick. Oh, notice that this is even just the wild animals. They didn't even chart the domesticate animals. And we invite puppy dogs in, inside to sleep in our beds. You know, we have kitty cats run, wandering around the kitchen. You know, those animals actually get sick 10 times worse than, than the wild animals that are found. So, so I just wanted to put that all in perspective. All right, so let's, let's start thinking about things that the honor is asking us to look at. So what is a bat? Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it Superman? Or is it a mammal? So, so we're going to explore that. So you don't have to start writing these down, but you can if you want, but we'll, 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 uh, I'll let you know when we can start filling in your worksheet. So mammals have hair and birds have feathers. So when you look at a bat, here's a picture of a bat. This baby bat, actually not a baby, but this bat just had a bath, a bath, a bath bat. And notice how they're, they're uh, washing its hair and they're, they're combing it out with a brush. I, they're actually using a toothbrush, but that's because bats have hair, just like you and me. I don't have as much as I used to, but but they do have hair. And of course, we all know when you look up uh, at a bird very, very close, you have bird feathers. So bats definitely, in this category, bats have hair and, and birds have feathers. Mammals have babies and birds have eggs. So when a bat is born, it comes out like a little animal. It, it has, you know, the, as you see the picture there, it's got the big eyes and got big, big ears and the nose and the, you know, it's, uh, it's a baby. And uh, when a bird is born, it comes out as an egg and it has to, has to finish getting ready to hatch. And then when it hatches, it's, it's a baby bird, it's all those things. But when it's actually born, it actually is born as an egg. So mammals have babies, birds have eggs. In this situation, a bat would be a mammal because it is born live. Mammals babies nurse. So when you were born, your mommy made milk for you uh, because you are a mammal. So she was able to feed you with milk. When a baby bat is born, it crawls up on its mommy and its mommy has milk for the bat to, to drink. A baby bird, on the other hand, when it's hungry, its mommy has to go out and find worms and grubs and stuff, chews them up, munch, 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 and, and basically pukes in their mouth kind of thing. So it's very tasty for the birds, but it is not milk. Um, so that, that's, that's a big difference. So in this situation, the bat would indeed be a mammal. Birds are warm-blooded. I'm, I'm sorry, birds and mammals are both warm-blooded. So this is a thermal imaging uh, pictures and shows what a bird looks like. So when something is warm, it, a thermal imaging camera will show it as a brighter color. When something is very cold, it'll be very, very dark. So in the upper left, I'm sure you can all recognize that, that's some sort of a bird, maybe a cardinal or something. Uh, you can see that a bird is warm. Uh, you can see the warmness coming through the eyes and the body. Uh, it has some warm blood pumping through its veins. The lower left corner, I um, think you can probably all figure that out. That's a primate. It's not me sitting around having lunch, but it's a, it's a big ape. Uh, you can see it's got, its face is very warm because there's blood pumping through its face, uh, through its chest, blood's pumping through its chest, through its arms, through its legs. He is indeed a warm mammal. All right, the lower right, what's that guy? That's what we call a scorpion. Scorpion, it looks like it's completely black. And the reason why is because there is no blood pumping through the scorpion. The person holding the scorpion behind the scorpion is warm blooded because he's a human or she's a human. And you can see the blood on his or her shirt uh, pumping through because it's keeping things warm, but the scorpion is cold blooded. So the upper right is a bat, knows the bat. He's got a lot of bright spots in him. He's got his face just like the birds and the, and the gorilla there. His legs, his arms, so you can see his little fingers and his wings and so forth. So a bat is indeed warm-blooded, just like a bird, just like a mammal. So on that one, you really can't, you really can't say definitively, but they are both warm-blooded. All right. So another question, hands or feet or wings? So mammals have hands and feet. Um, sometimes they both look the same. So, you know, my arm looks very similar to my leg. 
structurally. Um, it may be different sizes of bones, but it's, it's really the same kind of structure. You know, I, I have two bones up here, and if you look in my lower shin, there's two bones down there. It's, it's a very similar structure of, of for every mammal. So when you look at, here's a picture of a bat that they've taken the skin off of one side. So there is a leg, and the arm um, is actually very similar structure to the bat's leg. Uh, it's just that it has really, really long fingers. Look at those long fingers on the end as opposed to the short toes. But when you look at the kind of pieces that there are there, uh, that's what you have. Now a bird is different. So if I were to go to KFC, and I understand that you do have KFC there in, in the, in the, on your side, but when you go to KFC and I were to order a bucket of, of uh, wings or thighs, I would notice that when I tear the, the meat off the bones, that those bones are very different structure. A bird has legs, but it's a very different kind of structure than a bird's wings. They're, they're not at all similar. There's, there's just completely different kinds of bone structure. So in this situation, the birds really only have two legs and no hands. And uh, you know, a, a dog and, and other mammals and so forth may have four legs, but if the front legs are different than the back legs, we, you know, we tend to call them arms instead of legs. But in this case, a bat is a mammal instead of a bird, more like a mammal. All right, so here's where you start your worksheet. So is a bat a mammal or a bird? So mammals have fur or hair, check. So they have hair. So this would make a bat a mammal in this situation. What about have live young? They bear live young. Uh, check, they also bear live young, unlike a bird. Do their babies nurse from their mothers? Babies nurse, check, they do that. Uh, birds do not do that. Are they warm-blooded? Again, this one you can't, you can't be definitive because birds are also warm-blooded, so you can check that. Mammals are warm-blooded. And they often have four legs, often with toes and or hands and feet. So do they have four legs or do they have wings? They, they have the legs, uh, front legs and back legs. So they would indeed be uh, a mammal. So I guess uh, maybe whales don't have that, but for the most part, all, all mammals do. So therefore, we can say that a, bird, that a bat is indeed a mammal, okay? So, but there is one major difference between the bat and all other, all other mammals. What, do you, what is that? It can fly, you know, unless you're Dumbo, I guess. Um, but uh, uh, bats are the only animal that we know of that actually flies. Oh, but gling, 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 gling. Haven't you heard of something called the flying squirrel? I understand that there's quite a few flying squirrels in England. Uh, if you've seen one, put that in the chat box. I'd like to know that. I've never actually seen a flying squirrel. But a flying squirrel, I think most kids know this, don't actually fly. What a flying squirrel does, it climbs the top of a tree and it jumps. And it goes down, 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 down. It doesn't come crashing down. It, takes, it may take a long time to, to come down, but it's a glider. It actually glides. It doesn't fly like a bat does. Now, to be fair, a bat also has to climb to the top of a tree. If a bat were on the, on the ground, it could not take off and start flying. A bat actually has to drop from something, catch wind underneath its wings, but then it can start flying up and up and up. It can fly and fly and fly and fly until it gets tired. It can keep going up and up and up and up until it gets tired. It's not a glider like the flying squirrel. So the bat truly is the only mammal that, that we believe is actually can, can fly. All right, so number three, the honor wants you to know that the, uh, the order that bats belonged in, belong in. So there is actually called chiopra, and this is, comes from two Greek words. Cheer means hand, and petron means wing. So in essence, it means hand wing. So a bat is not up there flopping its arms. It's actually opening and closing its hands as it's flying around. It's actually hand wings. So the order is chiopter, and in the meaning is hand wing, because those truly are hand. When you look at a bat, that little pointy thing sticking out is the thumb, and then you see its fingers, and in between the fingers is the webbing. So it's opening and closing its fingers, and that's, that's how a bat can actually fly. All right. Now I want you to know the largest and smallest bats and where do they live. So the largest bat is called the flying fox. Um, it's one of, a fruit, one of our fruit bats. Look at that girl in the middle. Doesn't she look pretty scared? 
No, she doesn't. You know why? Because, because she's not a banana. She's not a papaya. She's not some other kind of fruit that this bat would like to eat. These bats are uh, what we call fruit bats because they're not interested in, you know, sucking your blood or anything like that. Matter of fact, they don't even eat insects. They don't even eat bugs. They like fruit. They fly around in the daytime and they're looking for fruit. They like to eat fruit. So these live in Asia and Australia, uh, five foot seven inch wingspan. So I'm five foot 10. So uh, when I stretch out my arms from finger to finger, that's about how big these bats are when they, when they fly. They fly around in the daytime and they're look because, because they have big eyes and they're looking for fruit, fruit trees. And, they're, and that's what they're after. The tiniest bat that we know of goes by two names. It's either a, either a, a kitty hog's nose bat or it's, it's called a bumblebee bat. I, I, I'm a, actually partial to bees. I'm a beekeeper. So I, I like the name bumblebee bat. But it depends on where you're from. Uh, they, they primarily live in Thailand and a five inch swing span. So if you can if you open your hand, that's kind of what, what one of these bats would look like, but they're very, very light. Um, and these we believe are the smallest ones. So again, these are a bumblebee bat and they live in Thailand. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, oh, gosh, I had actually had some of these in a little acrylic thing. It was kind of cool to look at, but. So that's like only 10 or 11 centimeters long. I mean, that's with wingspan. That's not very big at all. Not very big at all. Not very big. I'm glad you can do the conversion. I, uh, my iPad's not open right now, so I can't do that. <laughs> all right. The order Chioptera actually has two suborders. There's, we call Mega Chioptera and Micro Chioptera, but they tend to be called by other names too. And I like these other names there because these sound more like Batman, Mega Bat. The Mega Chiopteras, we call them Mega Bats. And the Micro Chioptera's, we call Micro Bats. So the Mega Bats tend to use their eyesight. Um, so they, they generally fly around in the daytime, they see things and, and that's what they go after, just like any other animal that we have. Now the micro bats, they use something we call echolocation. In the beginning, man could not figure out how could a bat fly through a room with a whole bunch of wires and strings going from wall to wall and the bats not hit anything in complete darkness. So they, they covered its eyes and it flew, still flew just perfectly. You know, they would, they would try different things. They would chop off parts of its wings or do other kinds of things. And the bat would still make it through this room without touching any wires. And they could not figure this out. It wasn't until they actually cut, uh, closed their ears, sewed their ears shut, and the bat couldn't fly anywhere. It kept crashing into everything. And they realized what was happening was the bat is throwing out a signal, a sound, and then it listens for that echo to come back. And so we call that echolocation. Now, God used this in some other animals, too, like uh, the porpoises and dolphins, you know, the ee that they make. When they do that, they're actually sending out signals and they're listening for that to bounce back. There's some cool video where some people who are blind actually have learned how to ride bicycles by back, making these kinds of noises. And they listen for the echo to come back. And um, so we man has actually adopted this technology in the uh, submarine, you know, the ping, ping, ping. That's what it's doing. It's called echolocation because it throws out a sound, it listens for the echo to come back. So the, uh, so the one that uses the echo locations are primarily the micro bats, okay? And the ones that the, the mega bats tend to use their eyesight to find all their food. All right, so the, the general diet of the mega bats, um, we, uh, um, here's, a, here's some pictures, so basically, uh, I don't know about your camps, but over here we have some camp songs. You know, I like papayas. I think the mangoes are sweet. I like bananas. Or maybe I got that backwards. But nothing can beat the sweet love of God, right? You guys have that over there? Nod your head, Chaster? Yeah. You are not allowed to ever sing that song again unless you also like bats. Because if, if it weren't for bats, you wouldn't have all those other fruits in the grocery store. Uh, down in the tropics uh, areas where they, where they tend to grow the mangoes and bananas and papayas and so forth, they depend very heavily on the bats for pollination. Uh, if it weren't for bats, you wouldn't have them. It's kind of like the honeybee in, in, our, in our areas uh, that tends to pollinate all of our food crops. Down in the tropics, they, they depend on the bats going from flower to flower to flower, and they spread the seeds and so forth. So they eat the fruit, nectar, and pollen, and those tend to be the larger bats, the mega bats. It's not all the, all, some, there might, there's a, I think there's a couple that may eat insects or something, but for the most part, 
they, they eat fruit, okay? Now the microbats, they have the most variety of a diet. For the most part, they eat insects. They eat moths, they eat mosquitoes, they eat um, cockroaches, they, eat, they, they love bugs, they love bugs. Uh, there are a few that, that eat some fruit, but for the most part, they just eat bugs. And again, like I said, there's only three of them that we know of that actually drink any kind of blood, but you'd have to be like a little salamander or a very small frog or something for them to be interested in you. Uh, some people say, oh, no, no, I've, I've heard stories about, you know, bats eating sheep and dogs and so forth. And actually what they found out is that they do hang out and hang on sheep and dogs and such, but they're not after them. Um, basically, they're, they're looking after the bugs and insects and mites and so forth. So if you see a bat on your dog, on your puppy dog, it doesn't mean it's trying to eat your puppy dog. It means you need to give your puppy dog a bath, okay? It's got fleas, and the bat likes the fleas, all right? So just make sure you understand that. Um, so the question is, how many kinds of bats are there? So this, this slide is a little bit dated, but I like it because it breaks down the percentages. But we know that there's over, so this slide will say over a thousand bats. And we actually, we're, we keep finding new bats every year because now we have better technology to, to listen for bats and we can, you know, every bat sounds different, just like birds have different calls. These bats have different sounds. So we're actually finding new bats every year. So it's actually, this total has actually gone up to over 1300 bats that we know of. And so, but, but this slide, I like this slide because it, it indicates that roughly 15 to 20% of them are megabats. And the other, you know, 80 some percent are microbats. So there's a lot more microbats than there are megabats. But uh, again, so you can either say over a thousand or over 1300, it doesn't matter. There's a lot of bats that out there and we're finding more each year. That's, that's what I'd like you to, to understand. So the question is, is how many, uh, I'm sorry, how many babies does a bat have each year? And what do we call them? So this is what a pup looks like. We call them pups. Why? Because there's, here's a puppy, right? I think so. You know, do you think so? I think so. And um, so a mama bat will typically have one baby per year, one pup per year. So uh, just like you and me, uh, typically one baby per year or one baby per, per birth, if you will. And then uh, there are instances where bats have had twins, just like people can have twins. They can have triplets, but they're even more rare and quadruplets and so forth. But for the most part, when a, when a mama bat has a baby and they typically only have one per year, it's just one bat. So that's why it's so critical to take care of our bats. If, you, if uh, something is happening to get rid of our bats, like poisons or fans or something like that, we, we really should pay attention because it takes so long for a bat to repopulate. You know, if you think about other mammals, uh, cats and dogs and rats and bunny rabbits and so forth, they tend to have several babies at a time, like, you know, anywhere from six to 12 babies at a time, and they can have multiple litters per year, you know, uh, three, four, five litters per year. So it depends on the species, but it's not uncommon that one mommy can have 50 babies per year. Well, bats aren't that way. Bats only have one baby per year. That's why it's very critical when something is happening to bats, we need to make sure we try to protect them the best we can. Okay, so each uh, each mommy only has one baby per year and we call them puppies, pups. All right, so the dishonor wants you to, to know three locations in the Bible where it talks about bats. To my knowledge, there are only three locations and two of them are very similar. These are what we call the dietary health laws. Two of them are found in Leviticus 11, and Deuteronomy 14. And this is where he says, you know, these are the birds. Notice he says the word birds. You are to regard as unclean and not eat because they are unclean. The eagle, the vulture, the bird, 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 the stork, and any kind of heron and the hoopy and the bat. He finishes up with the bat. And Deuteronomy, very similar, 14, he says, you may eat any clean bird but these you may not eat, the eagle, the bird, the bird, the bird, the bird, the bird, and he lists all kinds of birds. And then he finishes up that list, he says, and the bat. So I want to spend a couple of times talking about these first two verses, because people uh, who are trying to say bad things about the Bible and tell you that you shouldn't believe God and, and so forth, really use these two verses incorrectly. Uh, what they do is they say, see, we all know that a bat is not a bird. I mean, that's the first thing we did in this lesson, right? We've talked through, there's, you know, they're warm-blooded, they have babies, they have milk, they have, you know, all those kinds of stuff. It's obvious that a bat is not a bird. So therefore, 
when you read the Bible, if you read the Bible, you shouldn't pay attention to anything scientific in the Bible because the Bible is just wrong. Well, that, that's not really fair. Let me explain why. So there's something called the Linnean classification. And this is where everyone got together one day and said, hey, you know, let's, let's start, uh, let's figure out how to classify animals. Let's, uh, here's what it takes to be a reptile. Here's what it takes to be a mammal. Here's what it takes to be an amphibian and so forth and so forth. Well, the problem is they didn't have that discussion until after this part of the Bible was already written. So it's really not fair to hold Moses and, and uh, the, the Bible writers who wrote this before that conversation ever happened. So that, that's, one, that's one example that you can, you can throw back at folks who, who try to say that. But probably the more important one that I want to tell you about is something called ALF. So the Hebrew word for bird is actually called ALF. So the ALF. And when you look in Hebrew, it actually means fowl or winged creature. Well, we know that a bat is not a fowl, but it is actually a winged creature. So it was actually improperly, improperly um, translated, if you will. So if you're going to blame anybody, you can blame King James. It was his fault. But uh, definitely not Moses. Don't blame Moses because it, 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 a, a bat is a winged creature. So if you're thinking about it, uh, if you're going to make a list of animals of winged creatures, you don't know that all the Hebrews know what a bat is versus a bird. So you can throw a bat in with, with that class, and it makes perfect sense for them to do because it was indeed a winged creature. So I do want you to understand um, that because that these verses are used a lot when people say, don't believe the Bible, science, da 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 da, da. So I want to put that up on the table and say, you can refute that one pretty easily. If, if they're still complaining about that, they just really haven't done their research. All right. The third verse that you need to know about, and this is a prophecy verse, it's in Isaiah 2.20. It says, in that day, men will throw away to the rodents and bats, their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made to worship. You know, and basically the, the whole idea is that in the very last days, things you think are important, you know, your PlayStations, you know, your, all your other games and your toys and all your, your rich houses, your cars and so forth. It's not going to be anything. It doesn't mean anything in the time of the end. So um, what do you think about my picture of the bats here? You like that? I think I, I can hear some of you saying, oh, those aren't bats. Those are mice and rats. Well, you're right. You know, I used to think I could find pictures of anything on the internet. <laughs> but no matter how I looked, you know, with bats and rubbish, bats and trash, bats and garbage, bats and whatever, uh, whatever connection I could make, I could not find any pictures of bats digging through the trash. And if you think about it, because bats are not dirty animals, they don't like to be slimy and dirty. They don't like to dig through the muck. You know, unlike rats, they, they won't get around and crawl through that stuff. They, they, they like to be clean. You will find them at, at junkyards and trash uh, heaps flying over them, eating all the insects, but they're really trying to make life better for the rest of us. So they probably are associated with, with garbage dumps because they're flying around the outside, but they're not actually digging through the trash. So if you were to ever find a picture of a, or be able to take a picture of a bat digging through garbage, put it up on the internet. I think you, you uh, have done something. I don't think anyone else has ever done in the entire world. So, so uh, there, there's a challenge to you. All right. So those are your three texts you need to know. Um, so from the last uh, honor that we just learned about, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this. The question is, do bats hibernate? or do they migrate? The answer is they do both uh, for the most part. And there are a few exceptions, but for the most part, bats do hibernate and they do migrate. So they actually, uh, in large enough areas, they actually have migration routes mapped out where bats, and here's a picture of what it looks like in the United States. Um, in the UK, I was doing some research and uh, they do some migration a little bit. Only a few of them actually cross the English Channel. And they know that because they, they tend to land on boats that are crossing, uh, which is kind of kind of interesting. But for the most part, uh, bats do have a migration pattern that they, they tend to travel every year. But what they do is it's basically like a family reunion. So they all get together. So, you know, they come from different parts of wherever and they all get together, say, in, say Pennsylvania or Wisconsin or wherever they 
they get together and it's like a family reunion. Hey, cousin, how you doing? Hey, Junior's looking pretty good this year, you know, and they get up and again, they're very social animals. They, they rub up against each other and they, they, they say how you're doing and then they all go to sleep. They hibernate. Then they wake up in the springtime. Eh, that was good. And I'm, I'll see you next fall. And then they all fly off to wherever they wherever they spend their summers. So that's so bats actually do both. They hibernate and they migrate. They do both. Now, the honor doesn't talk about this, but I, I feel it's important to talk about. It. I used to love the idea of alternative energy and the, and the wind power and so forth, but not anymore. I am not a fan of the fans. So you've all seen it. I know that you have these over in England, too. I, I, I Googled it and I was able to see it. These big wind turbines that, that you know spin around and they create electricity. Sounds like a great idea. It's alternative to, to fossil fuels and so forth, but bats don't like them. And they could not figure out, took them the longest time to figure out why is it a bat who can hit a flying insect going really, really fast? How come they can't miss these blades that just kind of just wander around really, really slowly? And finally, somebody figured it out. Bats are not birds. What are they? They're mammals. I hear all of you saying they're mammals. So they're just like you and me, only different. So what was happening is if you were to go scuba diving, and you go down at a deep pressure and you come up really quick, it's something we call the bends. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard of the bends. So basically what your body, because you're a mammal, it doesn't like adjusting pressures that quickly. And so what happens is, is that if you were to do that, your insides basically blow up. Well, that's what was happening to these bats. So these bats love insects who happen to be around these, these fan turbine blades and they fly around them. So on the front side of these blades, as wind's pushing on it, it's a high pressure zone. On the back side of the blade, where the blade's trying to move, it's a low pressure zone, otherwise it wouldn't move. So that's why it's moving. It's going from high pressure on one side, low pressure on the other. So when a bat starts circling around these blades, it's going from high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. And the insides of the bats are just exploding. That's kind of what's happening on these things. That's, it's not the fact that these are moving too fast, that they can't avoid them. Their little bodies just can't take the pressure changes on the front side of the blades, the back side of the blade. And that's why they're, they're blowing up inside. So now when they when they put up these wind turbines, they, they do have to check for the migration patterns of bats. And I really hope they find a better technology for wind turbines than what they have right now, because right now they're just they're just tearing the bats up and it's 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 really not a not a good thing. So I am I am not a fan of the fans, okay? I'll just put that out there. All right. So think about this. Uh, speaking of migration patterns, uh, there is a place in Texas where every summer 20 million Mexican free tail bats get together. So put this in perspective. I understand London has 9 million people. Imagine if every single man, woman, and child in London got a buddy from somewhere else and got together, and you'd still need a couple million more people together to represent the number of bats that congregate in one bat cave in central Texas. It just boggles my mind. You know, the, the, uh, the question the last honor was about largest migrations. Well, this, this may not be different kinds of species, but this I think this is probably the, the most number of species that are of one species that gets together. This is thought to be the largest concentration of mammals ever in the world. And so I hope to get to Texas someday and, and watch it. It's kind of cool. So, all right. Mr. Morrow, I was yeah. there about, through, uh, I guess, uh, back in 2015, I was able to experience the, the bats coming out of those caves at night. It was incredible. You could stand on a bridge and they could be flying all the way around you and everywhere, but they, because of echolocation, because they're all micro bats, um, they no, didn't have to worry about being hit or anything, just could exactly. watch in amazement as these bats flew by the thousands and millions. It was incredible. I just cannot imagine you would find any insect in that in that whole county <laughs> with all I, I those don't bats eating insects. Yeah. Are a problem. No, no, just amazing. Or they have too many, and then maybe that's why they they congregate there. I don't know. So, all right, okay. So if you look at your worksheet, there are several blanks on this picture, and so we're going to go through them and see if you know. And I'll um, I'll. Let, give yourself a point if you're the first person to post the answer on the, on the check. I won't ask who you are, but, you know, say Glenn. And so, for example, the very first one I might say is the thumb. We're going to work our way uh, counterclockwise around this picture. So the thumb is the first finger. So a bat is just like you and me, only different, okay? 
just like you and me, only different. God used the same Legos to put us together pretty much. We both have thumbs, and he's got a little thumb on this. Bats have thumbs too, all right? So what do you think we call the first finger? The answer? I'm sorry, that was the first finger. Second finger is the second finger. You guys you guys probably got that. I'm sure you got that. I've taught this so many times. I can't believe I missed that one. So you get the first finger, you get the second finger. What do you think we call the third finger? Third finger? Call it the third finger. Yeah, we call it the third finger. All right. So see if you see a pattern here. What do you think we call the fourth finger? Uh, the fourth finger? Fourth finger. Yeah, exactly. So um, I'm sure those kids probably did it quicker. They probably have better primary school than you and I did, Mark. There so, you uh, yeah, our American system's not, not the greatest sometimes. Um, okay, so this one I'm going to throw you for a loop. What do you think we call the fifth finger? The pinky? I don't know. The fifth finger? Come on. Yeah. So, all right. I so thought you, you the were first... trying to trick us, so I was going <laughs> after something else. All right. This next one is actually something that, that everyone has, but we don't really talk about it much. It's called the tragus. Tragus is this little, let's see if I can get up here in the camera. It's like this triangular part of my ear. So it's, we talk about our ear lobe a lot. We talk about, you know, how big our ears are. Mine's really big. But the tragus is, uh, is this part like right in the middle. So that's very important for bats because a bat may look like it's the same color, the same size, the same whatever as something else, but their traguses between the species are very different. So some, some bats, some species will have long pointy traguses, some will have short rounded traguses, some will have triangular shaped traguses, but those are all because of how they, they hear the echo come back. That tragus plays a big important part of that. So. The tragus is a very important identification part on a bat. All right, so let's get back to stuff we probably learned in kindergarten or primary school. So beneath the bat, there's these long appendages that hang out. What do you think we call those? Leg, yeah, just like you and I. So they also have legs. At the end of the legs, they have some dangly things with little toes on them. What do you think we call those? Foot, yep, just like you and I. Now, here's, here's something that, that they have and we do not have. They have something called a calcar. So a calcar is, is a piece of calcium that grows out from the ankle of a bat. And what that does is that, that enables the bat to help manipulate its wing membrane, okay? So it's a, like a, it's a solid piece, but they can, by twisting their ankles in and out, they can actually manipulate their, their membrane when they're flying. All right, so you and I don't have this next part, but our, our cats and our dogs do. They have a tail. And then between the tail and the legs, we have something that we call the tail membrane. So that's their wing, if you will, that's uh, between their legs. From leg to leg that includes the tail, we call it the tail membrane, okay? Now that part in the middle of the leg, we call it the knee, yep, the knee. And then, so we had the tail membrane. We also have the wing membrane. So remember, they really don't have wings, but, but we did call that one a wing membrane. Must have been somebody that didn't, didn't go to primary school to figure that out, but he, he named it wing membrane. And then, so what do you call this up here? My, my favorite answer to Oshkosh was muscle, but- uh, Bicep? We call it forearm, yeah, the forearm. forearm right there, okay. yeah. So, uh, but, but that was my favorite answer ever, muscle, when I pointed to my- Muscle, I tell you what. Yeah. Yeah, this next part, I've got some pretty big ones, probably bigger than this guy here, but they've got ears just like you and I do. And then where does the bat keep its watch? On his wrist, yeah. So uh, if you look at this, this list of uh, things on the bat, you'll find a lot of similarities between bats and humans. And you know, a lot of people say, well, that talks about evolution and so forth. I, I, the way I answer that, I just say, you know what? God used the same Legos uh, when he made bats and when he made people. You know, he put us together in, in much the same kind of structures. Uh, we have very much the same kind of structure. It doesn't mean we descended from one another. That just means that God used the same Legos. It's the same same author that, that put the Legos together, right? Same Legos. Okay. I, kinda, I well, like that. I like that yeah. metaphor. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, apologies to copyright issues, but yeah, I like to call it Legos, so. Um, so hopefully all of you got those answered. Uh, you probably got them answered a lot quicker than I did. So benefits to man. So, uh, this, an insect 
a single brown bat can eat like 1,200 insects per hour, 3,000 to 7,000 per night. And I forget the name of the one in, uh, in England, but I think you also have uh, a bat that can eat 3,000 per night. So uh, benefits to man, they can eat a lot of insects. So you back up to 14, 1,200 insects per hour. Um, that's just a lot of insects. You know, if you like to go outside and you don't like it because there's too many mosquitoes, there's too many moths or too many of this, maybe you should put up a bat house. You should encourage bats to, to come there and live otherwise. And uh, they love to eat insects. Imagine for every bat we lose, that's, that's that many more insects we have to live with here on this earth. Isn't, isn't God so good to put those on? on our, I mean, granted, Satan had some, some things that caused mosquitoes, but uh, he also gave us, but God gave us bats to, to take care of the mosquitoes. We need that's to uh, need to do that. Yes, it is. So, and plus, if, if uh, they didn't get rid of all the insects like gnats and so forth, it would ruin a lot of crops that we use for food and so forth. Another benefit that uh, bats give for us is uh, they pollinate. So we talked about, you know, the papayas and mangoes and bananas and so forth. Um, so they're pollinators. They spread seeds and they, they go from flower to flower. I want you to notice the bottom here. It's a picture by Merlin D. Tuttle. Merlin D. Tuttle. Uh, Google that guy. Um, I believe he may have been an Adventist. Um, there's a lot of similarities that kind of indicates he was an Adventist, including he graduated from Andrews University. But uh, he dedicated his life to, to uh, bats. He uh, got tired of all of the pictures of bats looking, you know, the Dracula kind of scary bats. And he knew that they were a beautiful animal and he dedicated his life to photographing them in, in, um, in good pictures. So uh, when I went to Oshkosh, I didn't know this. Uh, I had a guy named Bob Moore who was a, uh, he was a retired math teacher from Andrews, was helping me. He had done so much research. He actually knew a lot more bats, about bats than I did, but he actually came across this, this tidbit of uh, Andrew's connection, and we suspect he was. I, I did find Ann Merlin Tuttle uh, on a website this, this past week and sent him an email hoping he would answer. He hasn't responded yet, but uh, uh, he lives in Hawaii now, but he grew up in Tennessee. Um, he, uh, went, like I said, graduated from Andrews, and he's got a lot of... Uh, um, a lot of lot pictures, huh? Yeah, he's done a lot of good things for bats. Uh, he's he's um, credited for for saving some bats from extinction, bringing bringing news about them. And he, there's some organizations that basically the Merlin Tuttle organization. I, I forget the name of it, but, but yeah, Google him. It's just fascinating. So I'm hoping someday he returns my returns my email and I can chat with him a little bit on this. So, okay, um, but, we are, just to to kind of watch our time, we are running close right. to the end of our time together. Okay, I'm going to be really quick here to run through the rest of them. So. All right, so the last benefit to man, uh, scientific research. Uh, we talked about the echolocation earlier. Um, also, uh, Draculin is a is a uh, something that they're looking, that they're testing to help maybe help stroke victims. All right, so I just want to tell you that I, I did a lot of research on bats for United Kingdom and so forth. And you guys have a really cool organization over there. Um, it's called Bat Conservation Trust. And, and you really appreciate bats. And you, you, um, it's just amazing when I was reading all the good things that they're doing for bats. And I really encourage you to, to look at their website and figure out what you can do to help bats in your, in your area. That's very good. So bats are protected and are a very important part of uh, the UK's ecosystem. Um, this organization does bat surveys and so forth. So I want to give them a plug. I got a lot of great information from them because you do have to know some bats that live in your area. So at least seven of them, I'm going to, I'm going to run through these. So there's the common soprano pipstro. Um, the, apparently, this is the most common. That's probably why they, why they call it common. Oops. 75% um, of all bat sightings, it's probably going to be one of these guys. A wide range of habitats. And so, again, these eat 3,000 insects per hour. Um, so they're actually even better than the brown bat that I mentioned a while ago. Um, so the difference is usually the, the calls, and, and that's how they tell the differences when they listen to them. Something called the noctule, N-O-C-T-U-L-E. This is a large bat you could find just before sunset. Uh, they say it flies like a swift bird in a steep dive. So I would imagine that's, that's pretty entertaining to watch. Something called a leisure's bat. I can't read that because of stuff on my screen, but uh, uh, people tend to call it the hairy armed bat. So it's a similar to the noctule, but it's smaller and it's got, it's got longer fur on it. There is also something called a round long-eared bat. So uh, they call it long-eared because its its ears probably resemble mine. It's, it's uh, got big ears. 
Uh, flat like a butterfly, sting like, but it doesn't sting. Uh, slow and hovering, common but hard to see after dark and in vegetation. There's uh, something, uh, I don't know how you say this, but Dobbyton's bat. Um, this looks pretty cool. I, I saw some videos of this, uh, basically watching it skim across the water, uh, picking up insects. Uh, bats are, are really, really cool the way they do this. And I, I just love some of these pictures watching them using their feet. Uh, some bats actually use their tail. They scoop it up in their tail to grab things. This one uses its feet to grab insects. Pretty cool. Greater and lesser horseshoe bat. Uh, that poor guy's got, he needs a nose job or something. But uh, yeah, the horseshoe bat's got a very distinctive looking nose. Um, he's able to wrap its wings completely around its body while at rest. Different from the greater horseshoe bat whose face can usually be seen. So when they're hanging there, you can you can see it, and this probably looks more like the cartoonish uh, um, uh, Draculas when you see them hanging out down there. All right, so the honor asks you to actually put up a bat house and watch it for, for three months. Uh, I was told that some clubs said, eh, we're close enough, let's just all go to the zoo and watch a bat for a couple hours and, and we'll call it done. I, I, it's a great idea. I, I do like the idea of going to a zoo and watching bats and so forth, but that's really not the purpose of what the honor is trying to tell you to do. The honor is trying to tell you, help help out the bats, put a bat house up. And uh, so where should you put it? And I, I, I um, in, in your handouts, there tells where to put it. Um, I would suggest to you that uh, check out that website that I just talked to you a while ago about. Maybe there might be some more references and materials and with your organizations around. And I I highly encourage you to look at that. So make sure it's in a good sunny spot. They like dry spots. Uh, I do want to point out the guano area. I told you the bats don't like to poop and pee where they where they sleep. So the bat box actually has an opening on the bottom. So they poop and pee and it drops down. And that makes awesome fertilizer. You can actually go to flower stores and, and, um, and buy that for a plant to help out your plants, but it's not good for your dad's car's paint job, okay? So do not do not put a bat box over a place where somebody might be parking a car because that stuff will fall down on the car and, and possibly ruin a, a paint job. So I do want to uh, point that out to you. But again, check out that website. Uh, you can do this on your own or you can do it as a club or maybe to church. You know, maybe you maybe you uh, get together as a club and, and, and build a bat box or you, you can even buy one and put one up at your at your church or maybe your school or somewhere like that. So you can keep an eye on it. Uh, I know my wife just. As, much, as many times as I've taught this on her, she still doesn't like the idea of me putting a bat box outside my house. So I, I can't do that. Uh, I, gotta, I, gotta, I have higher powers to, to answer to. But, um, but I do encourage you to, uh, so what I did was I, we, helped, we, we built a bunch of bat boxes and we put them up at our summer camp. So, so do something you can to help put bat boxes up and, and help, help bats, okay? And like I said, check out your website. You guys have a great resource over there. Uh, I do want to point out that when I taught this at Oshkosh, the very first guy in the very first morning, he made a beeline, or I'm going to call it a bat line, straight to my booth. And this is Mike. He's from Southern California. He was excited about bats. So I, I don't know that any of you would ever be as excited about bats as Mike was, but I, I do hope, and like I said, hope and pray that um, after this presentation, you at least appreciate bats much more than you did previously.